Okay. Okay, so um, welcome to this webinar series on microglia. Um, my name is Guy Brown and um, I'm from the University of Cambridge. Um, my co-host um, today is Claire Butler, also from the University of Cambridge. Um, and this series consists of monthly talks of 45 minutes by European scientists uh, talking about their research on microglia, followed by a five or ten minute Q&A session. So today's talk is going to be by Bart de Struper of the University of College London and the University of Louvain, and he's going to be talking about um, astroglia, microglia crosstalk as part of the cellular response to Alzheimer's disease. So during the talk, um, if you think of a question, please write it in the chat function um, and address it to everyone. Um, and then at the end, we can uh, read out those questions. Um, and please keep your microphones muted and cameras off to preserve bandwidth. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to my co-host, Claire, who's going to introduce our speaker. Great. Thank you, Guy. Um, so a little intro on Bart. So Bart is the founding director of the UK Dementia Dementia Research Institute. He's an Alzheimer's disease researcher and supervises a laboratory with researchers based at the UK DRI at the Francis Crick Institute in London and also in the VIB laboratory at um, Leuven in Belgium. Uh, Bart Distrooper's research is focused on translating genetic findings into mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases and drug targets. He is best known for his work on the priscillins and the gamma secretase and more recently for the work on the cellular theory of um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. He is the recipient of several awards, including the Brain Prize in 2018. So with that, I'd like to um, give the floor to Bart. So yeah, over to you. So thank you very much. Uh, um, I'm very pleased to, to give a seminar about our work. Uh, I would like to qualify that I'm not a very uh, big specialist in microglia. My interest in microglia grow because of the genetics of Alzheimer's disease, as I will show you. And uh, I'm still uh, um, uh, struggling to get my mind completely around the complexity of microglia, which are in fact very fascinating cells. So um, just as an introduction, um, I think that over the last years, our vision on Alzheimer's disease became much more interesting. So um, when I started, we were mainly focused on the biochemical aspects of Alzheimer's disease with the accumulation of amyloid plaques and neuronal tangles. And then at the clinical side, people were uh, basically saying that Alzheimer's disease and dementia are, more, are, are, equal, are equal to each other. So I think that we are very far away from that type of thinking, both in the clinic and in the basic sciences. Uh, in the clinic, we know that there are many causes of dementia and dementia is just an... Um, and, and symptom. And at the side of the basic science, we know that if you take away the amyloid plaques or, or, or try to use an antibody against the tau, that is clearly not sufficient to get a magic cure for Alzheimer's disease. And I think the major clue to, to, to solving this puzzle and to, to bring us in a new frame was the realization that it takes about 20 years to move from this amyloid plaques appearing in the brain towards this neurodegeneration phenotype in the clinic. And so there must be a lot of things happening in the brain before you end there. And so I like to think about this as the cellular phase of Alzheimer's disease. And instead of having this very neurocentric view where amyloid hits the neurons, the neurons die, you get tau, or the neurons start to change their metabolism and get tau, and then you get dementia. I like to think about um, the, the process as, uh, as in all complex disorders, uh, feedback loops forward and backward, uh, uh, healing responses and disease responses. And I also like to think that all the other cells in the brain have an important role into that game. And so the second important clue to all this thinking is the genetics. I always think that genetics is the clue towards human disease because otherwise you can speculate in any direction. And so when you know that the gene is associated with the disease and you know that the molecule encoded by that gene is associated with the disease, you have already at least some strong, uh, some, some, some ground to make claims. And so we know that APOE4 is the strongest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, which also makes that people think that lipid metabolism is very crucial in Alzheimer's disease. I think it's a bit uh, shortcut, um, as you will see later. 
Um, and then there are not enough twin studies, but large, uh, a large Swedish study, which is always cited in this, uh, in this, um, in this regard, which shows that about two thirds of your risk for Alzheimer's disease, for getting Alzheimer's disease is in your genes. So it's really an important genetic component also in the sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And so here you see the classical GWAS studies, which illustrates this. So there is plenty of genes over the different chromosomes in your genome. And I must be a little bit more correct. There are plenty of gene loci over the, the, the chromosomes, which are, have been associated in uh, GWAS studies with your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And so APOE is clearly one of these major uh, risk loci, but also PCALM and CLUM. And here TREM2, which has really launched the microglia thinking in the Alzheimer's field. So TREM2 is a lot of risk associated with TREM2 and a lot of other genes here. But it's also very interesting because usually we think about risk uh, for the gene of the gene loci which reach um, genome-wide significance or the, this red line here. But there's still a lot of genes here, which you see here, which are also associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease, but we didn't reach until now full, um, full um, recognition as a canonic gene or gene locus, locus in Alzheimer's disease, but still there is risk associated with these genes too. And uh, one of the people who um, influenced me a lot in the thinking was uh, Valentina Escott Price in Wales, who makes these polygenic risk scores, which he learned from the field of um, schizophrenia. And so this is basically a simplistic way of presenting or, or to try to combine risk, but it's, it's a way to do it because what you basically do is you add in an in summation um, the risk associated with every SNP in the genome, and then you calculate a polygenic risk score for individuals. And if you use that, you, can, you see that your um, prediction for Alzheimer or not becomes better and better the more genes, the more genes with lower uh, p-values, the more genes you add to your uh, polygenic risk score. And so basically it tells you that also in the genes which are associated with disease at p-value minus four, which is far below the genome-wide p-value, which is five times 10 minus eight, even those genes, they add to your prediction for or not Alzheimer's disease. So the question, the question I want to address here is, how can we use this genetic information to generate functional hypothesis? So it's very nice to describe all these gene changes, but then a gene, a gene is not a drug target. Uh, a gene also doesn't tell you how it makes you getting Alzheimer's disease. So it's a big question. And then the second thing I would like to say is here, it's not enough to knock out that gene or to increase the expression of that gene and then hope that the phenotype of the mouse you make will tell you what's going on. Uh, you need to ask a little bit more precise questions. You need to ask what are these genes doing in a genetic relevant context, in a pathological relevant condition. And so you will see a lot of the work we did over the last years, and we are only starting to harvest the fruit of these efforts, is to create models in which we can ask this type of questions. And so a first run, uh, and it has, uh, uh, it's a paper we published at the beginning of this year, a first run to this question was, can we use the mouse models which exist already and combine that with the information we get from humans to make kind of insight in what genetic risk of Alzheimer's disease means. And so the problem with the mouse, they, the mouse models we have at the moment is that they are a little bit simplistic. So we, they are based on overexpression of the genes which cause familial Alzheimer's disease or familial frontotemporal dementia. And so if you overexpress pristillins or uh, amyloid precursor protein genes, you get these amyloid plaques in the mouse but they don't get Alzheimer's disease. They do not get massive neurodegeneration and they do not get a tangle pathology, which is essential for Alzheimer's disease. On the other side, when you overexpress tau with a, uh, with a mutation which causes frontotemporal dementia, you get, of course, overexpression artifacts, but you get also nice tangles. But, but what you are mimicking is basically a direct induction of tangles, but that's not what happens in Alzheimer's disease. We know that in Alzheimer's disease, in the familial forms that you get first amyloid and that you then get the induction of tangles. And it's not necessarily the tangles of frontotemporal dementia, which are similar to the tangles you get in Alzheimer's disease. So it's kind of complicated. In both cases, it's overexpression. Uh, uh, we get very little 
not very clear dementia symptoms in these mice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are a lot of limitations. Of course, you can go to human human samples, but there we are very much limited because most of these samples are post mortem, very high heterogeneity. The quality of the samples is very different, and so you also have no information on the initial biochemical cellular changes. And so this conundrum exists already for, for decades in the field and it has really harmed our progress because it's very difficult to know when you test a drug and you test it in these animals, whether it will translate into humans. And on the other side, you never know whether a change here has anything meaningful for drug treatment because this is in fact when it's already too late to treat the patients. So we were thinking maybe we can use this mouse and look what transcriptomic changes occur and overlay them with human genetic data and see whether the, to what extent changes in this mouse are overlapping with the predictions of the genetic uh, experiments. And so what we did is a classical uh, um, uh, omic experiment where we uh, micro dissected all the hippocampi from tau and from APP mouse, amyloid mouse and tangle mouse. We had the nice controls. We took them at four months and at 10 months and four months and at 10 months. The phenotype of these two mice, so the amyloid mouse, the APP amyloid mouse and the tau amyloid mouse um, are very similar at 10 months. Uh, all the behavioral changes are very similar. And at four months, they have not much behavioral changes, but both in the APP mouse and in the tau mouse, we see the initial um, appearance of uh, amyloid plaques and of tangles. And so we have the possibility now to compare age. So we compare the, the transgenic at four months um, and at 10 months. We can compare genotypes. So is there a difference between wild type and transgenic? And we can use the age genotype interaction. So uh, what happens at uh, 10 months in the transgenic compared to all the other uh, models. And so I'm going to go quickly because it's published. So first we compare the age. Uh, changes. So we look to all the transcriptional changes in this mouse uh, with age. Um, and you see that in the tau mouse and in the APP mouse, the genes which are changing are very similar. Uh, the colored ones are uh, significant in either the APP mouse or in the tau mouse. But you see that the overall changes are very similar. So the two models age very similar, which is, which is a good, good thing. If we then take the genotype changes, you see that the tau changes here and the APP changes. So what you compare is the tau changes induced in the wild type mouse and the amyloid changes induced in the wild type mouse. And you compare the changes in the tau induced model and in the APP model uh, in the two axes. And then you see a very different, different picture. You see that the tau changes, these orange ones, um, are mainly lowering expression and that the changes in the amyloid mouse, these blue dots, are mainly upregulation of genes. And so um, if you look down to the identity of the genes here, many of those are involved in neuronal phenotypes. So tau affects basically neuronal phenotypes. And in the blue, the blue dots here, which are upregulated, most of them are involved in inflammation. So that tells you already that amyloid and tau have very different effects on the models. And then you see when we include H here in the comparison, that the changes in the APP mouse become even more strong. So you have a lot of gene changes in the APP mouse. In the tau mouse, there is not much changed anymore. So the changes which you can see at four months are still present at 10 months. So, so, so complete different uh, phenotype also in the APP and the tau mouse. And most of these genes again are inflammatory genes. So we try then, so, so this is what happens in the mouse. Uh, interesting, but is it relevant for humans? And so what we decided is, let's look for gene enrichment uh, analysis in these changes and see what genes identified in the GWA studies are enriched in the tau or in the EPP model over uh, when they are exposed to amyloid or to, to tangles. And so here again, I come back to the slide I showed you uh, a few slides ago, where I said that depending on the p-value you choose, more genes or more gene loci are altered or associated with Alzheimer's disease. And you see, if you take the official cutoff, which is five times 10, 10 minus eight, sorry, so this is minus seven, but you take 10 minus eight, you have about 40 genes which are officially um, associated with Alzheimer's disease. But when you go to minus seven, you have 66. And if you go to 0 0.1, 
you get more than 2,700 2, genes loci over the genome, which are associated with Alzheimer's disease. And so we did then gene set enrichment analysis in our three different comparisons here, looking to the different levels of P values, increasing levels of genes, and we looked for enrichment in these different comparisons. And so to make a, a complicated story simple, we only see gene enrichment in our APP transgenic mouse in the interaction H genotype. So that means that most of the genes which have been identified in GWAS studies are upregulated basically in our APP transgenic mouse. So, and, 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 and most of these genes, as, as is also known from other analyses, are enriched for inflammatory functions, as you can see here. And so when we did, and this is just an exercise, uh, I will make a conclusion in a minute. But so when we took all the genes changed in the APP mouse, which are differentially expressed in the mouse, and we take all the genes which are identified at a p-value of 0.001 in GWAS studies, and we take the cross-section of these genes, so these are genes induced by APP, significantly changed in the APP model, and associated with Alzheimer at a threshold which is usually not taken into account, we get 18 genes uh, in this analysis. And so many of these genes are, of course, uh, also present at a high p-value for GWAS studies, so APOE, clustering, CD33, PLC gamma, SP1, FC, FC gamma receptor, um, are in this intersection, but also we get an enrichment for genes which have been under the threshold and which are strongly associated in, uh, in this study to Alzheimer's disease in the mouse. And they are granulin, they, 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 they contain progranulin, TREM-like protein, HEX-B, uh, LIN1, BLINK, and other very interesting genes. So this is a way to increase genes which from the GWAS study are below the threshold into your genes to be studied and prioritized in your study uh, by, by, by comparing them by comparing the, the, the physiology and the gene studies. So, yeah, I'm going to skip this one. So thus, the conclusion of this story is that genetic risk genes in sporadic Alzheimer's disease define an inflammatory response to amyloid plaques, not to tangles, and point in the first place to microglia for the cellular response in Alzheimer's disease. And so this study also uh, yield a series of genes which need to be further functionally analyzed in the microglia. So, but before doing that, we set up a second study, which is a, a single cell study, because we know now that we had to look to the microglia. And so we used the APP knock-in model from Cyto, an Alzheimer model, um, which, is, uh, which has the advantage that it doesn't use overexpression. So the transgene is expressed from the normal endogenous APP promoter, and if you do single cell uh, analysis, you prefer uh, this type of model and not overexpressing models where you, where you um, express your gene from, from artificial promoters and get expression of the protein in all kinds of different cell types. And so this model uh, induces plaques over time. So we, we, we isolate a microglia at three months, at six months, at 12 months, and at 21 months old. Uh, and we did SmartSec, and, and similar studies have been published by Krasemann and Karen Scholl in 2017. And we finally, after a lot of struggle, we got our paper published in, in, in 2019 in, um, in cell, cell reports. And so here you see the result of the sequencing work. So this is a cloud, a Disney plot of the microglia isolated at these different time points, and where we look to where, where the program, basically the bioinformatics program, analyze how cluster the different transcriptomes of the microglia in this cloud. And so, because these are all microglia, they are clustered together in a big cloud, but you can subcluster in different responses. And so we have two homeostatic uh, responses here. Uh, we have an ARM response, which is an activated response of the microglia. We have an interferon response microglia, etc., etc. So I'm going not in the details, you can read uh, about all the different transcription profiles which define these categories in our paper, but this is one of the more interesting aspects here, at least from the Alzheimer's point of view. So we have here this homeostatic cluster one and two 
and we have this ARM cluster here. And what you see here is uh, what percentage of the microglia in the APP mouse in orange, in the amyloid mouse, and in the control mouse, the, homeo uh, the, 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 non the, the non transgenic mouse, have a certain cell state over time. So this is at three, at six, at uh, 12, and at a 21 month old uh, amyloid mouse. And this is in the control mouse. And you see here the homeostatic cluster one, and you see that it remains very similar over time in the control mice, but you see that this homeostatic cluster decreases over time in the APP mass. And this is even more pronounced for the second homeostatic cluster um, in, the micro, in the amyloid mouse. But the most significant change we see in this ARM cluster, which is similar to the damage associated microglia from Ido Amit, uh, which increases strongly uh, in the amyloid mouse um, um, over time. You see that almost 50% of the microglia that we isolate from the mouse at 12 and at 21 month old are in this, uh, in this phenotype. It's not completely exclusive for amyloid mouse because you see here also in the wild type mouse that in aging, a non, non insignificant, so about 10 to 12% of the microglia adopt a very similar transcriptome profile. So you could basically say that this arm response is in fact an accelerated aging response. Um, um, if you want to cut some corners here. So we can then do this pseudo timing. So this is the same data I just showed you before, but now um, uh, um, using a bioinformatics tool again, where you try to, to cluster or where you try to rank the different microglia uh, transcriptic profile the, the ones which are more close to each other in the beginning, and then so you go farther and farther. And so you get this pseudo time, and you see that the microglia we harvest from this experiment split at a certain moment in a major IRM interferon response microglia and, an, and this uh, ARM response. And if we look then to, to these responses and we look to the individual gene expression in these different microglia, you see that we get very strong upregulation of APOE in this arm response, at the tip of this arm response, where we see that APOE goes even up 100 fold. So this is a very important uh, uh, gene in this arm response to the amyloid plaques. Uh, you see also SPP1, for instance, upregulated, or DIC, uh, um, DICOP2 here, which is a very interesting, a very characteristic gene, but only in a very limited number of um, arm response genes at the tip of, the, of this response. You see here this IFI3 and IFI7, which char characterize this, uh, this IRM response. And so these genes, uh, I'm only going to focus on APOE because I don't have enough time to go into the details. But um, so you can see that this ARM response is also enriched, well, as I said, for uh, APOE, but I'm going to skip this. So if we look then to the APOE transcription um, um, and we do an in situ hybridization, you see here in this mouse, these amyloid plaques, and you see that they are circumvented with microglia strongly upregulated APOE mRNA. So these microglia, which are induced uh, by amyloid plaques, cluster um, around the amyloid plaques, and they are mainly overexpressing APOE. And I, I found this really one of the most remarkable findings, and we are not the only lab to, to find it. Uh, um, um, uh, several groups in the world have shown this, so one of the major risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, which is this APOE polymorphism, gets strongly upregulated in microglia when they see amyloid plaques. And so this brings in fact this APOE, which was before associated with lipoprotein metabolism and astroglia, brings in fact this major genetic risk factor in the microglia close to the amyloids. And I think that this is even more fascinating than the observation that REM2 which is of course also a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, is expressed by microglia. But so both these genes are in microglia. And so now the question is of course, whether this APOE has a role in the microglia activation um, and uh, um, whether it's not only a marker for this response, but also really an active player. And so again, a big story, which has taken us quite some time, but uh, what we decided to do is to knock out APOE and to see how that influences the microglia response in uh, amyloid uh, generating mouse. 
So we did again this, this single cell analysis, but here this, this summarizes the findings. So we have here the amyloid plaque mouse, um, and you see that they get a strong response um, uh, against the amyloid plaque, so this arm response, this activated response, response microglia. And you see that in the knockout, this response is completely or almost completely wiped out. So you need APOE, the microglia need APOE to build this arm response. So it's not only a marker of the response, but it's an essential part of the response. And so when we look then to APOE, the protein here, you see that the microglia, which are clearly activated in the presence of the amyloid plaque, this APOE here, which covers the amyloid plaque, this is the protein, not the mRNA. So it comes from this microglia and it covers this uh, amyloid plaques. And we are not sure what exactly it does with this amyloid plaques, uh, but it's clear that we need APOE here to get this microglia responding to the plaques. And apparently, and this is something which, which was already shown also by, by, by other groups um, uh, years ago, in the absence of APOE, there happens something with the amyloid plaques. It gets a different structure, as you can see here in the APOE knockout mouse. But you see here uh, further that this microglia do not get activated and do not cluster anymore around these amyloid plaques. And so the question is whether APOE is directly doing something on these amyloid plaques or whether these microglia interact with these amyloid plaques and need APOE to reshuffle these amyloid plaques. And the last question, which is probably the most important one, is this activated microglia, which you see here, is this something good or is it something bad for the brain? Is this the next step? And will this activated microglia then induce abnormal tau physiological responses and, uh, and cause disease or not? And to be honest, I think some people claim that they know it, but I don't think that we are yet there to know what exactly happens. And a lot of work in my lab is trying to find that. But so as an intermediary conclusion, I, I would say here APOE, GWAS risk of Alzheimer's disease, age, which I showed you, gender I didn't show you, but gender, if you take female microglia or female mouse, you see that this, um, this activated response happens faster. So you have an earlier uh, appearance of this dumb response or this arm response in the female microglia. We don't know what it means, but it's interesting to know because these are four major factors where we know that influence your risk of Alzheimer's disease. So they affect microglia response to amyloid plaques. I want to make a disclaimer here. I'm focusing here on microglia, but this does not tell you that these factors also do not affect other aspects of the cellular response. And so a lot of work is, has to be done also on astroglia and on neurons to see how these risk genes affect their response to amyloid plaques. But it's very clear that microglia have a central role in the pathogenesis of the disease. And so this brings me to a next part of my talk, uh, um, uh, both at two, in two, two ways. So first of all, I like these single cell approaches, but as you know, and, and, and there was a nice paper from Beth Stevens on bioarchive now, but we have also seen that, um, when you isolate a microglia from their environment, that's not innocent. So this microglia responds to that uh, procedure and so part of the activation and part of the transcriptional changes to see in, micro, in single cell uh, studies have to do with microglia responding to the isolation itself. And so we think that it's very important first to control for that, but second also to find ways where you um, look directly to cells in situ so that you don't induce these artifacts induced by isolation of single cells. And the second reason why I wanted to look directly in situ is that we are looking to Alzheimer's disease in the same way Alois Alzheimer looked to the plaques and tunnels in the beginning of the last century. And so in the meantime, there are so much nice technologies to have a full omic approach to this problem and to look what happens, not to four or five molecules at once, but to hundreds and thousands molecules. And so, um, so we wanted to, to adapt spatial transcriptomic studies to the study of Alzheimer's disease. And so the two pictures you see here are this, um, separated by more than a century, but they make both the same point. So Alois Alzheimer already showed you how cells react around these amyloid plaques. And so some people say that amyloid plaques are innocent, but I don't think that they look to the picture because there is a lot of cell reactivity around these amyloid plaques. 
as always Alzheimer showed. And here you see a, um, a, a picture which I stole from a website from a modern uh, Alzheimer researcher, Michael Hennica. And you see here this, this fire almost of microglia around the amyloid plaques showing you that there is really a cellular response among the amyloid plaques. So what we decided to do is to use again our knock-in model and to look what happens around the amyloid plaques when they appear over time at 3, 6, 12 and 18 months. You see it's really a massive amyloid plaque accumulation. And here you see a staining for uh, astroglia marker. So GFAP. Um, and you see here some GFAP positive astrocytes around the amyloid plaque at the beginning of the disease, but you see it becomes really massive at 18 months. And so these are not microglia, these are astroglia. So there is a lot of cellular response around these amyloid plaques. And so we are very early adapters uh, at the moment. The technology has improved a lot and you can now buy also the, the slides, etc., from 10X. But we, we used the slides as they were developed in Sweden by, um, by Lundeberg and colleagues. And so here you have such a slides which we use for spatial transcriptomics. And what we basically do is we use one slide for the spatial transcriptomics and we use the two adjacent slides to annotate information uh, uh, um, regarding this, 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 um, these spots. And so you will see how that goes. So you have here again, this uh, spatial transcriptomic slide. You have these spots here and every spot have, has uh, oligo DTs, as you can see here, and a barcode. And so what we do is basically we, perme oh, sorry. So we permeabilize the tissue on top of this oligo DTs. Sorry, sorry, I'm coming back. So we permeabilize the cells above these uh, oligo DT spots. The mRNA is attaching to these oligo DTs, and then we can do the C, the release, the, uh, we can sequence and release the cDNA. And using the barcodes here, we know where the mRNA, which we sequence here, was localized in these spots. So this is really fantastic work, a fantastic tool, because you can, um, you can then do Disney plots with these different uh, tissue domains. So these are small circles of about 100 micrometer with 10 to a few hundred cells. So you can do Disney plots. And basically one of the things we did here was use the information in these Disney plots to see where these spots were located in the brain. And so for instance here, this is the most striking example. We can use this really in an unbiased um, Disney plot. We can use this to identify the spots which were in the CA1, CA3, and data, dented gyrus in the hippocampus. And so you can do that for all the other, other areas of the brain as well. And we can also see at what stage the, Disney, the, the, the spots are from, uh, from the mouse Alzheimer's disease. So the, the, the three months cluster here and Alzheimer's disease are three months clusters here. And then you see that, that at 12 months, we get this cluster here. Um, and at 18 months, we get this cluster here. So this, these spots really contain information about the disease uh, uh, pattern. And then we needed to make uh, some automatic um, measurement of amyloid plaque exposure uh, so that we could use the computer to, to link uh, transcription profiles to amyloid uh, load. I have no time to go into details, but here you see, for instance, such a ring uh, which is loaded with a certain amount of amyloid. And here you see another ring loaded with another uh, uh, amount of amyloid. And we basically found that the standard deviation of these stainings is the best way to quantify the amyloid load in every spot. And so you see here that we have a load for every spot in the mouse. And so again, to make a very long story short, so we have now 10,000 transcriptome profiles of tissue domains. We have them from four time points. We can compare wild type with amyloid plaque mouse. We have a regional annotation, so we know where the plaque is coming from, and we have a plaque index uh, so we know how much amyloid was present in the spot uh, which we analyze. And you can do temporal resolution, early versus low late onset. You can genotype differences, transgenic versus wild type. And you can use spatial resolution. You can look what happens close to plaques versus far away from plaques. And so um, I'm just going to give you one highlight. So you get this type of, of slides here, of, of, of graphics here, where you see changes according to the genotype transgenic versus wild type, and you see changes according to plaque load uh, uh, in this axis. And so if you look to this quadrant, 
you see the genes which are upregulated close to the amyloid plug niche. And this is mainly driven by the amyloid, and this is mainly driven by the gene, uh, the gene expression, so the, the genotype. And so here you see two, two of these analyses. Um, and so you see here a lot of spots. Every spot is a gene uh, changed in, in expression according to genotype and according to amyloid plaque. And you see at three months of age that here a whole cluster of genes which are co-regulated, these red genes are upregulated. And when you look to the identification of these genes, there are genes which are expressed in oligodendrocytes. And a lot of them have to do with um, with um, with uh, myelin, uh, and don't get confused because a lot of these names here, like TREM2 and 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 and, and C4P, these are the purple dots here. So so these are microglia dots. I, I talk about that in a minute. But so these red ones are mainly oligodendrocyte genes, which get upregulated at three months and downregulated at eighteen months. And so we wonder what happens. So that means that there is something in the white matter which reacts on the plaques, which gets upregulated early on and then downregulated later on. So we are wondering whether, I mean, white matter is almost never studied in Alzheimer's disease. And so we wonder whether this is something protective or something disease, we don't know, uh, which, 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 which is happening here. So we are looking at that. But the second response is more familiar. So these purple genes are not much changed at three months, but then they get really strongly upregulated at 18 months. And some of these genes I mentioned already, like granulin and APOE and TREM2 and TYROBP, so very familiar, but let's have a closer look to them. So here you see these genes again, upregulated at 18 months, and we call them plaques, plaque-induced genes, PICs, so plaque-induced genes. And so we overlap them with the ARM response, which I discussed already earlier with you. Some of these genes, so the PIC genes are the red one, some of these genes are also microglia, induced uh, arm genes or dumb genes. And so you see the genes which overlap between the two here. And then some of these genes also overlap with activated astrocytes. Not too many, but still quite some. So complement genes, GFAP, serpent 3, etc. And then there are a couple of genes which are not in the two, two other cell types um, and which are uh, listed here and they are very interesting. So a lot of complement, complement activation, endocytosis, uh, lysosomal degradation, oxidative stress, immune process, response, and antigen processing and presentation. So this cluster encompasses all these genes. And so the most exciting stuff here was, was this uh, circus plot, where we um, have all these big genes enlisted here in the circle. Um, and so the green genes are genes which are mainly in astroglia. The blue genes are genes which are mainly in microglia, and you see that in the wild type situation, these genes are more or less co-regulated co according to cell type. And here you are a couple of genes which are not so much co-regulated in wild type situation, but they come strongly engaged when the cells, and when we, we start to study these genes, um, co-localized with amyloid plaques. And so here you see Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and Q4 are those those tissue domains which are most exposed to amyloid plaques. And you see that genes start to be really co-regulated in astrocytes and microglia. And so we think that this means that astrocytes and the microglia have crosstalk here and co-regulate their genes together. And so we know that some of these are, 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 are complement genes in the two, uh, but there are also a couple of other very interesting genes um, which we are looking at more closely. So this concludes this part of the story. There is much more in our paper. And uh, we had, in fact, 10 of these co-regulated networks. We focused only on the PICs and on the oligodendrocytic uh, network, but there's still a lot to be, be found there. But so basically, PICs are a gene regulatory network over microglia, astroglia, and oligodendrocytes, which coordinate the reaction of the cells towards amyloid plaques. And so, um, so I made most of these conclusions here, so I'm going just to move forward. And so now I'm coming into the last part of my talk, where we try now to, to, to make sense out of the cellular phase and the cellular reactions in a more human model. And so this is really something which I'm struggling also already for a couple of years now. To what extent are mouse sufficient 
to model Alzheimer's disease. And, the mod and, and this problem becomes more clear when you start to think about the differences. So people tend to say that mouse genes and mouse pathways and mouse microglia are similar to human. And I think that for specific mechanisms and specific, specific questions, this holds true. But if you have a gene interaction network, or if you have a GWAS study telling you that 10 or 15 genes um, are important for Alzheimer's disease, and you are studying those 10 or 15 genes in the mouse models, then you become a little bit worried about the differences because every gene has amino acid differences, has slight differences between human and mouse. And this amplifies if you take more and more genes. And so this pathway, which is relevant in humans, starts to be much more, less relevant in mouse because the mouse, interact, the mouse genes start to interact with other proteins downstream in that pathway just because of these small changes. And so these differences amplify the more complicated questions you are asking. And so this made me thinking we need to improve the human, human approach and we need to be able to study genes in the context of a human genetic background. And so that's why I think that iPSC cells basically are our only way to do that. But yeah, iPSC cells in vitro, do they mimic anything which, which exists in vivo? And so, so yeah, so these questions pushed the research in my lab. And so we, so can we capture risk, risk of Alzheimer's disease in a human genetic and cellular context? So of course we use iPSC and EPSC cells. But can we study those cells in a biological disease relevant context? And so of course, if you want to do that, we need to use the single cell approaches and complex biology as I explained to you already before. And so, wow, I'm missing here a slide, I think. Yeah, I'm missing a lot of, of slides here. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to see. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm going to skip for a second to, to, uh, to this mode of, of presentation. So the first thing we wanted to do is to get um, human microglia in the brain. So we were thinking if we take away the mouse microglia and that's simple with the CSFR1 antagonist, you can do that. Can we replace, can we transplate, transplant human microglia back into the brain and get a good model for human microglia? And so again, I'm not going to, 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 to go into details, but it's, it's difficult because if you just take microglia differentiated in vitro and you transplant them, in a mouse brain, it doesn't work very well. So we developed a protocol where we go over um, embryo embryonic bodies, and then uh, by using the right cocktail at a certain moment, you start to get monocytes secreted. But we think that these monocytes are a kind of microglia precursor. This, this, this collection we transplant into the mouse brain, in a prepared mouse brain, um, a mouse which are at day, between, uh, day, which are at day four of birth, and they have been depleted from the mouse microglia. And so we inject this collection into the brain of the mouse. And you can read about this protocol uh, in details. We, we have a protocol paper in press, but you can also, if you ask me, we will send you the details of this protocol. And so it's not trivial because if you trans transplant the collection of this first harvest, you get very nice um, very nice um, colonization of the brain. So that's what we see shortly after transplantation. And then if we let this graft grow, you get more and more human micro, well, you get about 40 to 60% of the microglia in these transplantations are human microglia. If you do the same experiment with the second collection um, or the third collection of this uh, protocol, you get little and almost no um, colonization anymore. So. It's not trivial and you have to really standardize your culture very well. And what I think, but we are looking at that, is that at this stage, you get a kind of microglia precursor cell, which is still very, very well capable to, to adapt to the mouse brain and to colonize it. And you lose that probably in the, in the further culture uh, in vitro uh, um, of the cells. And so here you see a spectacular picture of um, of this uh, colonization. I can go back to presentation mode now, I think. So you see, I hope you see it. So this is a section of a mouse brain stained uh, in green uh, with the GFP marker, which we transplant in the microglia and also stained with human 
uh, marker of microglia, and you see that we have here a fantastic 60 to 80 percent um, colonization of the mouse brain with microglia. And here you see a more detail, detailed uh, picture of the cortex and of the hippocampus, and you see this nice spatial localization also of the of the um, of the microglia. So they uh, go into the micro domains of the mouse brain. Um, and here's the third. You see see human microglia here and mouse microglia, and they're really spread in a similar way as the mouse microglia, and they get this very nice morphology. Uh, so these mouse, these human microglia are different, so they are much more complex, and they are bigger, four times bigger than the mouse microglia. So it's really a different, it's not a different cell type, but it's a different cell uh, in the end. And so then we, we compared, and this is also again a, a single cell experiment from in vitro microglia and in vitro monocytes and in vivo microglia isolated from this mouse. And so what we did here, we isolated also primary microglia from humans. So we got sections from, uh, from the operational quarter from uh, uh, people where uh, the hippocampus was, uh, sorry, the frontal lobe was removed because of, uh, sur of surgery for epilepsy and got this fresh samples in and the surgeon said that this was healthy tissue so we need to believe it but this is the best tissue we can get and so we did also single cell analysis of this uh, in vivo uh, microglia and we compared them with the in vivo microglia um, profiles we got from the transplanted human microglia in the mouse and so you see that this 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 in vivo microglia have largely a homeostatic um, a homeostatic profile and so the in vitro cultures have mostly activated uh, microglia um, uh, profiles. You see here very nicely that the in vivo H9 derived microglia in the mouse are very similar to the primary microglia, have a very similar transcription profile as the human microglia derived from the patients. And so we think that these uh, are really very good models to do all kinds of studies. And so in the last two or three minutes, I will tell you what we are doing now. So one of the first experiments which we published already was to inject oligomeric beta into the tail vein of the mouse and see what happens with the human microglia. And so we, we took out the microglia after eight weeks. And so you did, we did single cell uh, transcriptomics, but I'm, I'm not going to details. Here you see the different genes uh, which we analyzed. And you see here the human response in these different genes over, it's again a pseudo time. So this, every line is a microglia. And so they are arranged according to the response to the oligomeric A beta. And you see here, for instance, that interleukin one beta is a very strong responder in the human microglia and much less so in the mouse microglia. And there are several other examples here of uh, interesting genes like CCL4 and CCL2, which respond differently in the, in the human microglia than in the mouse microglia when exposed to this um, oligomeric beta. And so now we have also data, this is unpublished data. So we have now also data of microglia exposed to the amyloid plaques in this mouse. So human microglia exposed to the amyloid plaques. And as you know, there is a lot of, of discussion at the moment in the field, whether this dumb or this arm response also happens in human microglia when they see amyloid plaques. And I think it's very difficult to know that actually because you are always limited to post-mortem tissue and we don't know what happens with this microglia when you isolate them from this post-mortem tissue. So, but we have a very nice model here to see what human microglia do when they see the amyloid plaques here and you see they get really very much activated, very like, very similar to what happens with the mouse microglia as I've shown you. I have the impression, but that's an impression that it's even worse than what we saw with the mouse microglia. So, um, but that's, that's a bit early conclusion. And here you see now the, the profiles of thousands of microglia uh, that we are studying at the moment, which we isolated from the, uh, from the mouse. So these are all human microglia, which respond in, to the um, amyloid plaques in the mouse. So it's, it's similar to what we did, but the scale is it's much bigger. Um, and so you see here H arm, this is the human arm response to, plaque, to, 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 to amyloid plaques. So it's very clear. That, that we have this arm response also in humans. And I think that Dido Amita and, and colleagues will be very happy to see that, that this is not only a mouse, a mouse response. And then here- oh, Can you um, start finishing up now? Because- Yes, minutes. I'm at the, last, at the last slide. 
So um, you see here um, um, the, the, this, this collection here, and these are density plots. So you see where most of the microglia are coming from the APP wild time are sitting. So they are here in this, this homeostatic cluster and this here where we are not still clear what it is exactly. But so these are the microglia in the wild type condition. And you see that there are, of course, in the, in the amyloid plaque also microglia there. But you see that most of the disease is occurring here in these areas where you have arm response, but also this cytokine response microglia. And we are very much interested in this because this is really enriched in the human response. So if you study mouse microglia, these are the Alzheimer genes you can study. These are the Alzheimer genes you can study when you use human microglia. And so it's sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Amyloid plaque is important, but it's a trigger, not a driver of the disease. Microglia are, in my opinion, and maybe the other cell types that has to be made, but microglia tell you what will be the end result. So you can have people who don't get Alzheimer because they have the right genes and the nice microglia response. And you have people who will get Alzheimer's disease because they react in a disease causing way to these amyloid plaques. And so these are, this is more speculative. I'm not going to say it. So these are the people who did the work. Renzo Marcuso drove all the microglia work. Mark Fears is the leader for the, for the bioinformatics. Where Ting and Ashley and Nicola did a lot of the bioinformatics, wonderful researchers. Where Ting was the driver after the spatial transcriptomics. Carlo and Anne-Marieke were uh, the, the initial drivers of the microglia work, which I've shown to you. These are my sponsors, and uh, I'm going to stop here so that there are seven minutes left for questions. I'm sorry. Thank you.